I unfortunately am not Arthur Brooks, a celebrated <laughs> professor at Harvard and author of many number one bestsellers from Love Your Enemies to most recently From Strength to Strength. Uh, and this gentleman happily is not Pico Iyer, <laughs> author of many books, including most recently two contradictory books about Japan. And we have never met until this moment. We spoke on the phone for maybe seven minutes, but I feel we've been meeting on the page for years and years, and we have so many friends and, and interests and concerns in common, and so I think we're both really grateful that uh, the Ideas Festival is allowing us to extend our conversation in real life for the first time. And I think since this is the first Ideas Festival to be entirely live for three years, I wanted to ask you, we all know that the pandemic has made so many things impossible. Has it made things possible for you? Well, thank you, Pico. And of course, I'm going to pause before I answer the question by returning the, the admiration. Um, for many years, um, I've been quoting your work. Oh. That actually, and, and mostly I've been talking about the, the critical importance as I teach about happiness, which is my main area of concern, that happiness is love. And where does that, where does that originate? That originates from all of the people that have been looking most deeply at the subject. And, and if you're going to boil down the secrets to happiness, and you boil them down to their essential essence, where do I find that? I find that from you. And I remember this one place, something that you wrote about as you were writing about our, our mutual teacher and beloved friend, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, whom you have been working with for 48 years that you, in, in one, in, in interviewing the Dalai Lama, he said that he starts every day praying for the Chinese authorities. You wrote that. Mm. And that had such a big impact on me. That had such a big impact on the way that I think, the way that I see my sisters and brothers around the world, the, 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 dig, the equal dignity of all human people. And the fact that, that I can destroy the illusion that somebody is my enemy by choosing to love them. I got that from you, yeah. and I want to thank you. Thank you. And actually, as I hear that, one of the things that also impresses me so much about the Dalai Lama is that he's a Buddhist who travels around the world telling us not to become Buddhists. He's a Tibetan who prays for the Chinese, and he always, and, and he's a leader of people who wants to be a student. In yeah. other words, he's always cutting through divisions and trying to remind us of the common ground, which you know, your book, Love Your Enemies, reminds us we need more urgently. Today. Indeed. So your question, which I'm going to turn back on you as well, is we're coming out of the coronavirus epidemic happily. I mean, thank God we're here together at the Aspen Ideas Festival, which is so wonderful. Um, but the real question is not whether we suffered. Some people suffered a lot. Some people suffered a little. But very few people, according to my data, only 7% of people wish it were still upon us. And that's because they're the equivalent of cats. <laughs> and... Um, me, I'm, I'm a dog, so and dog people are really happy to be out of the coronavirus epidemic. But the, the point is not that there was suffering. The point is what we learned from the suffering. And, and one of the things that it made it possible for me to do was to sort of put into perspective how to think about difficult times that we go through. You know, there's a tendency, and I noticed with every, in every conversation that I had with people during the coronavirus epidemic, to talk about all the things that you miss and from before, from the before times. You know, when we were in lockdowns um, and even beyond. And, and then also all the things we don't like about the lockdowns or about the, the epidemic. And that's really only two quadrants in a two-by-two two matrix of things that you like and things that you don't from before and after. Those are the two dimensions. It's, you know, what do you miss from before and what do you hate from now? The key thing is, what do you not miss from before and what do you like from now? Those are not normal dimensions to populate, but I got thinking about that and I wound up asking everybody that particular question, what are you, gonna, what are you not gonna go back to? You know, what is the opportunity that's been afforded to you? And almost inevitably, people talked about toxic relationships and things that were lowering their happiness and they were dreading going back to those things. And the question is, why? Why, why call her back? You know, wh why, why renew that particular relationship? Why? do the things that you were doing before, but to which you'd become so incredibly path-dependent. The epidemic is your gift to punctuate the equilibrium of your life. And then, what is the sweetness that you're actually experiencing right now that you don't want to leave behind? And that is really all about, to quote you, love. I mean, this is about the love relationships. Now, I realized that there were a lot of problems that it brought with respect to love. I mean, the coronavirus epidemic was the Divorce Lawyers Full Employment Act of 2020. 
but, but there was also a lot of sweetness that came from this. And, you know, for me, it was, a, it was an escalation in my love of the divine that I, that I discovered during the period of stillness. It was, a, 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 I got to know my daughter at a really deep level in the last year before she went off to college. I mean, I knew my daughter. We all know our kids. But not like that, you know, my daughter and I, we have a, a different kind of relationship than we ever did before and that we probably ever will. Now we talk every single day in shorthand and sort of the, the Morse code of people who've known each other for 100 years. That's what it feels like with my little girl. What about you? Well, exactly the same. I spent 200 straight days at my mother's lunch table, which hadn't happened since I was nine years old. And my mother actually died unrelated to the virus last year. So I was so grateful, thanks to the virus, I got to spend her last 15 months on Earth with her. I got to spend every hour with my wife, which life seldom allows otherwise. I know this is true of you too. Um, I got the writer's retreat of my dreams. You know, in 2019, I remember filling out a form, lots of paperwork to try to get three weeks at my desk in Canada. Suddenly, I got 100 weeks at my desk because I couldn't really travel. I got the chance to, you know, give myself uninterruptedly to a project because I couldn't. And I remember that the most salient example is that my wife and I were at my mother's house in the hills of California. We couldn't travel as we usually would. Uh, we didn't feel safe in the health club, so we just started taking walks every morning. Usually seven o'clock in the morning, it looked a lot like Aspen today. Golden light in one area, mist on the other. We'd turn around, we'd see the Pacific Ocean scintillant in the distance with the wrinkles on the islands beyond so sharp we could almost count them. And I would think, my goodness, this is more beautiful than what I'd go halfway around the world to see in Capri and Rio de Janeiro. It's in my backyard. My parents have lived in that house more than 50 years. I'd never walked to the end of the road uh, 20 minutes away till the pandemic. And actually, just to flow out, I loved what you said about equilibrium because my life was not perfect in 2019. And it's very hard to change your life when you're driving at high speed down a freeway. You have to get off the freeway to, to be able to turn, to be able to go in the other direction, just to be able to remember what you care about and what your priorities are. And so during the pandemic, I was also remembering that one time in my parents' house, I came upstairs and I saw the house was encircled by 70 foot flames that were being whipped on by 70 mile per hour winds. It was the worst fire in Californian history at that time. It broke out just up the road from us and I was caught in the middle of it for three hours. So I was very lucky to escape with my life, but I lost every single thing in the world, including most of my dreams of being a writer because my next uh, three books were all in handwritten notes. So it was a shock of the kind that everybody goes through many times in life. But after a few months when the insurance company came to us and they said, we'll replace all your things, uh, I thought, actually, I don't need 90% of the books and clothes and furniture I've accumulated. And I still wanted to write, but I had no notes, so I had to write from memory and emotion, something much deeper in my notes. And I thought, well, I don't really have a physical home here in California anymore. Maybe I can move to the place that feels like my heart's home, Japan. So I started <laughs> edging across the Pacific Ocean. And what struck with me from, through that experience, which I was thinking a lot about during the pandemic, was 450 houses were burnt down. And some people, I think, understandably were traumatized for life. But I think quite a few realized this is a chance we're down to ground zero to remake our lives much closer to the lives we've always wanted to live. And I'm sure you have this sense, and among your friends and family too, people are living very differently now because they've had the chance to think about what they didn't wish they weren't doing previously and wish they will be doing in the future. Mm. It's given us the chance to, to recraft our lives in many ways. The, luck, the fortunate among us who've survived so far. And I think all of us have so much to be grateful for because here we are in Aspen, most of us unmasked. We seem to have survived the first two and a half years. Indeed, one of the biggest problems, however, is that many of people have recrafted their lives without thinking purposively of what they want that life to look like. Most people, and a lot of, and a lot of us, we tend to look at the exigencies that we face, take those parameters, those circumstances, and, and live according to those parameters. And, and one of the things that I, I see that actually uh, gives me some pause coming out of the coronavirus epidemic, um, this is sort of the shadow over the blessings that we're talking about, is that you know, under ordinary circumstances, about 9% of Americans exhibit symptoms of clinical depression. Today, it's 28%. Mm -hmm. This has everything to do with loneliness and the structure of how we've come back to our work, mostly, um, in, in, with new technology. We don't, 
new technology is always a blessing and a curse. The blessing is that it gives us so many possibilities to do new things in new ways. The curse is that generally when there's a new technology that's highly inflecting to our society that we don't use it optimally for a long time. And this is what we find. You know, we talk about the great resignation. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trained as an economist, which I say, I, I promise I won't hurt any of you with that, with that knowledge. But the, 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 one of the things that we find in the world of labor economics is this great resignation uh, tells us that right this year, 60% of Americans say that they're gonna change jobs and probably 30% will. And that's a lot by historical standards. Now, part of that has to do with the fact that, that people can but the biggest part, as far as my data and research tell me, is that about half of the compensation from your work tends to be social. And when you take that away, you won't be conscious of it. You'll just like your job less and not know why. You like the, I like the convenience. It's fantastic. I mean, I taught a class last week. I was in Dallas and Colorado and Las Vegas and Michigan and back to Colorado, and I was teaching full time teaching a, a, but my executive education students in 15 countries around the world. I was unbelievably productive, but it wasn't the same. And what we find is that people are lonelier than they think, and they're more depressed than they understand, and it's especially true for young people. And for all of us who are in leadership positions, we're gonna probably have to be a little bit more compassionate, even if we're a little less empathetic about trying to bring us back together in person because humans are made for communion together in person. Love doesn't work all that well virtually. <laughs> <laughs> um, we need to be eye to eye and, and hand to hand, and, and that's really, really important for all of us, and that's one of the things that I'm quite worried about. Can I ask you, I think you told me in the two minutes we spoke um, before the event, you felt your spiritual life had really deepened yeah. in the course of the pandemic. Was that because you were looking for solace or because you remembered what's important in life? Part of it is that I was working, my, my coronavirus project, among other things, was I had just moved. I had left a chief executive job at, at a think tank in Washington, D.C., which I'd done for a long time. I'd done it for 11 years previously. And I came in the middle of 2019, not knowing there's a pandemic upon us, uh, to Harvard University, where I was teaching happiness. Um, then the whole world shut down. And I had an opportunity to pursue this new line that I was teaching and doing research on. And I wrote a book, but it was a very very, it wasn't research, it was kind of me-search. Um, and I was, at the time, you know, I'm, I'm still in my mid-50s, and, and, and I was thinking, what do, what, what's my happiness 401k plan look like? And, and so, and I wrote this up into a book called From Strength to Strength, which I've been talking about a lot this, this spring. That got written during the coronavirus epidemic. And part of my own happiness 401k plan was to live more consciously according to my spiritual principles. Uh, one of the things that's very clear in all of the research on happiness is that, that there's kind of four investments that you need to make. I mean, people have a lot of misconceptions about what happiness is and how to pursue it, but the one thing is that the happiest people, they pursue four things seriously. They put a deposit in four accounts every day, which is their faith, their family, their friendship, and their work that serves other people. In other words, it's love of the transcendent, whether that's the divine, depending on, you know, as we say in economics, your results may vary. <laughs> um, your family life, your friendships, real friends, not deal friends, and you all know the difference. And finally, it's, the, it's work that serves other people. It's love, 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 and more love is really what it comes down to, to, you know, to paraphrase, if I may, your whole body of work. <laughs> and, uh, and so this is really important, and I realized that I had always had plans to deepen my relationship with God. And I said, well, now's the time. You wrote up the strategic plan, you've got the time. And I, I read, I'm a Roman Catholic, and it's, it's the most important thing in my life. Easy to say, how am I living that? My wife, Esther, and I began attending Mass every morning. And we, except for when I'm on the road at Aspen Ideas Festival, I do to this day. It's a game changer. I start the day in communion with God. I end the day praying in, in my meditative prayer in the rosary. You do it your own way, whether it's walking in nature, studying the works of Johann Sebastian Bach, or returning to the faith of your youth, or developing a meditation practice. The point is, you have to do it seriously. And when I finally took my own advice, which is hard sometimes, <laughs> it, was, it, has a, it has had the biggest change in my life of literally anything I've ever done. So tell me about your deepening, because well, I know that this is important for you too. <laughs> it, it is, and I wouldn't, <coughs> I wouldn't consider myself a religious person but I hang out with monks a lot, including our friend in Dharamsala. 
And my friends ask me about that, and I say, well, I'm not very good with my MacBook, so I take it to the Genius Bar at the Apple Store. And I'm not so great with my life, so I take it to the equivalents of the Genius Bar, which I think are monks who've consecrated their lives to learning how to live, how to love, and how to care. And right as the pandemic began, as I say, I'm not affiliated with any religious order, but a friend of mine who's a prior of a Benedictine monastery sent a message to all his friends. Remember, the best cure for anxiety is taking care of others. Such a simple thing, and as you said, it's sometimes hard to put into practice just what you want to be reminded of. I have another friend who runs an Episcopal church in Richmond, Virginia, and he said just what you said, which is in the early days of the pandemic, quoting Goethe, he said, remember, Every day, try to take in one piece of poetry, one piece of beautiful music, and one piece of beautiful art, and that's going to change the proportions of your day and remind you of something larger than this moment. And I always remember Meister Eckhart, the great German philosopher, saying, if the inner work is strong, and this is what you do at Mass, the outer work will never be puny. And he's not just talking about work, he's talking about our relationships, everything in our lives. Um, you don't try to repaint your car. If something's wrong, you open up the hood. And that's, I think, what you're doing at Mass and what I'm doing when I go on retreat in monasteries. And one of the things that always strikes me about His Holiness the Dalai Lama that both of us have spent so much time with is he always reminds us from a Buddhist point of view, suffering is not the same as unhappiness. Um, all of us are going to suffer. Most of us, if we're lucky, will know old age. Nearly all of us will know sickness and all of us will know death. But that doesn't mean we have to be unhappy. And just as Arthur was saying, easy to say that, but look at the Dalai Lama. I sometimes think he suffered more than anybody I know. He lost nine of his 16 siblings when he was young. He's called a demon and a wolf in sheep's clothing by the government of the largest nation on earth. He hasn't got to see his home or the people he was born to rule for 63 years. And what's he most famous for? His contagious laugh, his constant smile, and his robust confidence. And, and I think what he's saying is the same as every wise person has said through history, which is we're not formed by our circumstances, but by what we make of our circumstances. And this is all through mm. your writing too. And Marcus Aurelius, everybody who's commemorated in the Aspen Institute is saying the same thing. I remember as a kid, we had to read um, Hamlet in, in high school. We came upon that line, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And then in college, I was an English major, so we learned Paradise Lost. The mind is a place in itself can, and can make a heaven of hell or a hell of heaven. Every single tradition has agreed on this. And so in some ways, whether you have a firm religious conviction or not, there's basic common sense about how to handle the mind, how to deal with difficulty, and how to think of reality as your partner. Mm -hmm. you know, all of us have partners, and most of our partners are difficult some of the time and impossible much of the time, but we have to work with them. That's, that's the deal. We can't pretend reality's not there, and we can't so easily change our reality any more than we can change our wife or husband, we work with it. Um, and I, you know, it's one of those things that we're always telling ourselves, but during the pandemic it really came home. And mm. I'm sure you have examples too. It's interesting that uh, you're teaching happiness to people in the mid-20s. So I, you know, I have sort of two groups that I'm talking to all the time. And I'm very lucky to write for The Atlantic, which is sort of the it magazine of ideas in American life today. I mean, I'm very, very, very fortunate to do so. Um, and I, when, I, when I'm looking at the, the people who read my, my happiness column every Thursday, every Thursday morning, it's two groups of people, people in their 20s and, and, and then people who are my age and older. I don't know what's wrong with people in their 30s and 40s, that's all I can say. That apparently, they don't want to be happy. But the point is that, and, and then I teach people in their 20s and their mid-20s about, about happiness. And one of the things that I find about young people today that is a big opportunity for us who are older is that people in their 20s have absorbed kind of an anti-Woodstock message. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and, and equally misbegotten. So in Woodstock, the, the, of course, I mean, I've used Woodstock as, a, as a, just a, a, as a totem for this, but it's that if it feels good, do it, which is life-ruining advice. Mother Nature doesn't care if you're happy at all. Mother Nature wants you to pass on your genes. Your happiness is up to you. You need to manage your own life and you need to go against your instincts a lot, which is, the Dalai Lama talks about this constantly. I mean, the Dalai Lama's not, if it feels good, do it. On the contrary, he meditates eight hours a day. Your, your tendency is to, you know, if he were going with his instincts, he'd be on Instagram or something, which he's not. You'll be happy to learn. Um, the, but the point of this is for today, it's kind of the opposite of that, which is if it feels bad, make it stop. 
And that's life ruining advice as well. You know, interesting thing is that meaning, which is one of the, I'm going to talk about this at the Greenwald Pavilion. I have a big talk about how to want less as opposed to how to have more, which is one of the key things that I learned during the, <laughs> what I've been thinking about during the coronavirus epidemic. But is that one of the macronutrients of happiness is purpose and meaning. We all know that. If I asked any of you, when did you come up with your sense of resiliency, your sense of purpose and meaning, none of you would say, oh, that fabulous week at the beach at Ibiza. <laughs> none of you would say that. That was fun, but that's not when you found your life's purpose. It was fundamentally, you're going to tell me about something that was hard, about when you were afraid, when you lost somebody to death that you loved, when, when somebody that you were in love with broke your heart. You learned about yourself. And that's really critically important. So it's not just a question of figuring out how bad things are good. It's a question of being fully alive and experiencing suffering. Suffering is unbelievably sacred. I mean, it can be too much. It can become a medical problem with clinical depression and anxiety, don't get me wrong. But ordinary lives have tons of suffering in them. And trying to avoid them, par paradoxically, you will avoid meaning. And when you avoid meaning, you'll avoid happiness. One of the great secrets to happiness is unhappiness. His holiness taught me that. Mm. Again and again and again, he said that. I couldn't absorb that until I finally, I think when I finally absorbed that was when I started teaching it, actually. <laughs> yeah, I've heard, I'm a great admirer of the Franciscan uh, priest, Richard Rohr, and he says over and over, there are only two things that teach us in life. And this is really what you were saying, love and suffering. Mm. Uh, and, and suffering's a harder teacher, and it grades, very, yeah. it grades on the curve, but we're likely to get more from that class. I've always wanted to ask you, ever since I began reading you, what do you think about the pursuit of happiness? Uh, the, the pursuit of happiness is a very radical concept, and of course, people often ask, I mean, the coinage of the term comes from Thomas Jefferson in, in the Declaration of Independence, the concept that, and, and, and interestingly, the provenance of this, is disputed, but most likely the case is that Thomas Jefferson is regarded as a great writer. He was not. He was a great copier of other people's writing. Um, George Mason had written the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which talked about life, liberty, the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, which was this Lockean notion that natural human rights would coalesce around physical things. Thomas Jefferson substituted the, the, the pursuit of happiness for the pursuit of property. He was later asked why. And he reportedly said, and again, this is disputed, but I choose to believe it, that, that he was taking dictation from the American mind. Now, this is a very radical concept at the time because uh, around the time of the American Revolution, uh, the concept of happiness is that it was a good life well lived, and it was really open to the gentry. Now, Thomas Jefferson's whole concept was that, you know, he was setting out the, the, the contract for a nation of ambitious riffraff, which I am, and which all of you descend from. I mean, look, we all have, there's a lot wrong with our country, and we all descend from different places with different stories, but this is what we all are, is fundamentally ambitious riffraff. And weirdly, we're proud of it, right? We're proud of it. That, don't, some of you who are, some of you are immigrants, and some of you are immigrants, and, and I say, thank you for choosing America, and I hope you stay forever because I want more ambitious riffraff. That's kind of what it's all about. So when I hear the pursuit of happiness, it's, it's a problem in trying to understand precisely what he meant by that, but it's aspirationally and directionally so fundamentally correct. You're not going to find happiness, but you can be happier, and the journey is the destination. The key to the treasure is the treasure. This is one of the great secrets, is do the work. Do the work. And you will actually become happier. And in that pursuit, you will bring happiness to more people around you. And you'll be living up to what I hope, I still hope, is the American promise. Yes. Mathieu Ricard, a great Buddhist monk, wrote a fine book on happiness. And he says, as you were saying, happiness is a muscle. We work so hard on you know, many of our other muscles. But if we go to the, as it were, emotional health club every day, we can increase and refine our happiness, our sense of concentration, and our sense of compassion. Um, but we so often focus on the outer part of our health and ignore the inner, perhaps. What I always think of, though, when I think of the pursuit of happiness is I go back and forth in life between California, which is <laughs> very pa passionately committed to the pursuit of happiness, I feel, uh -huh. and Japan, which is based on the reality of suffering, the Buddhist truth. And so when something like the pandemic 
comes along, I think many of my neighbors in California were really thrown for a loop. This is an affront. They this didn't know what to do. Reality is cheating us. Yes, right. yes. We're not prepared for that. Whereas my friends and neighbors in Japan, for better or worse, are conditioned to believe that difficulty is the stuff of life. And that's what we expect, and we're pleasantly surprised when it's something different. And so many of you will remember after the tsunami in, in 2011, um, people's lives had been devastated in Japan, and you'd see long lines of them absolutely silent, patient, uncomplaining, just waiting for a handout from the equivalent of the Red Cross. And that's partly because it's a seasoned culture that has been through 1,400 years of warfare and forest fire and tsunami and, and, and the typhoon, but also because they have the sense of collective mindedness and nobody was complaining after the tsunami because each person knew her neighbor had gone through as much if not more and that the one thing that she could give that neighbor was comfort companionship and maybe even a kind of um, any kind of optimism that could be salvaged that each person grieving about this was only going to intensify the sorrow of all so sometimes i think is uh, you know that happiness by definition can't be pursued and that these older cultures do have a wisdom in thinking um, in that life's never going to be easy. And in Japan, they have this wonderful phrase that life is about joyful participation in a world of sorrows. So you know that the world is going to be full of sorrows. That's a non-negotiable fact mm. of life. But that doesn't actually have to diminish your joy. And in fact, that ma that's what makes your joy necessary. Mm. With the Dalai Lama, I'm always struck at how you know, he came and visited places devastated by the tsunami because he felt his duty is to be in places of suffering in, or to be in Times Square or on the streets of Calcutta, not to be off on a mountaintop because that's where he can really help people the way a first responder or physician does. Mm. So it's an interesting notion of how if you think of uh, maybe including suffering in the vision of the pursuit mm. of happiness. Absolutely. It's so interesting because that differing perspective, when you think about a lot of people in the West who, who fall away from the faith of their youth, it's because of the hardship that they see around them, the tragedy that they see around them, which is utterly anathema to somebody like the Dalai Lama. It says, because, because there's human suffering that would actually alienate you from the concept of God, that's absurd. Mm -hmm. He would say, these are the opportunities for us to live in communion with each other more effectively, to give the love that we want to get. That is the ultimate purpose of who we are as human beings, which is, which is su such so important for all of us to remember. You know, the, um, it's a, the, when I was studying um, meditation with His Holiness's monks in, in Dharamsala, um, I learned I was in class with one of his senior monks, and he was explaining to me the, a concept that, that I've heard of before and that almost all of us have before. He was trying to explain to me deeply this concept of emptiness, mm -hmm. this Buddhist concept of emptiness. And that's, that's basically what that means is when you consider yourself as an individual, this... this uh, this stimulates the concept of emptiness because in point of fact, you are individually empty. You are someone only in the context of connection with other people. There's an illusion that Pico and Arthur are two different people. In fact, we are only whole when we are one. That's the concept of emptiness. And the way that that's really interesting in the Japanese concept is the Zen Buddhists took the same, some about a thousand years later, the concept of emptiness and they explained it in terms of a paradoxical question that will be posed to, no, novish, to, to novice monks, Zen Buddhist monks. And you've all heard it before, it's almost a joke at this point. What is the sound of one hand clapping? And, and you're supposed to ponder that. And it turns out that the answer is that it's actually not a question, but the sound of one hand clapping is the answer to the question, who am I as an individual? And the answer is, it's an illusion. I look like a fundamental being on my own. Not unlike the aspen tree that you see out here. All of the aspen trees on the entire aspen campus are one plant. One plant. But they look like individuals. Emptiness is the existence of one individual plant. You cut down one tree, the plant continues to live. This is a, so th this is a concept that I think that we can all explore a little bit more. And the coronavirus epidemic or any tragedy or anything that, we, that befalls us is to, to, to reduce it to nothing more than something that shouldn't have happened. And evidence of the absence of the divine is deeply, deeply misbegotten. Do you agree? I very much agree. By the way, I, I love that. I've lived in Japan 35 years. I've never heard that go on explained. Now I know. Yeah. And you're right, because emptiness is often misunderstood. And just as you said, His Holiness says emptiness means emptiness of interdependence, or in other words, emptiness right. of... Um, but I absolutely agree with you. And 
I was mentioning my friend who's a prior of a Benedictine monastery. And long before the coronavirus, for, in 2017, they were cut off from the world for seven months by winter storms. Most of his monks are 83, 85 years old. They were being helicoptered out to die. He, to spend time at their bedsides while they were dying, had to take a secret, treacherous back road three hours to the nearest hospital. Then finally they opened again, and the virus came and closed them down again. They were just beginning to sputter into life, and a drug dealer right next to them set off a fire, and they all had to evacuate. And for five weeks, firefighters were trying to protect the property as a conflagration wiped out 120,000 acres. And yet, my friend is constantly cheerful, just as his holiness is. And he would send in his newsletters, don't worry, everyone, we're observing the office every day, we're hanging fine, and in fact, our, our sense of communion and prayer is deeper than ever before. And I asked him, I said, you've enacted the book of Job. <laughs> What's with this? And he said, if, it, if things aren't going all right, that means it's not the end of the story. In other words, he gave me a, a, a beautiful Christian reading that the story ultimately is, is going to end up with something good. And, and so one has to bear with the suffering, learn from the suffering, not push the suffering away, as you were saying. In his case, in the conviction that there's a larger order and a pattern to things. And... Um, the divine is not going to leave us desperate and abandoned. Indeed. It's very moving to see that. Um, now, I see somebody flashing a sign that suggests um, we should open to questions. We still have 15 minutes, so time for lots of questions. I think there are two mics, and I see a question just over there, um, the gentleman in the pale shirt. Hey, thanks. Um, I like to think of a lot about like evolution, evolutionary psychology, and yeah. you know, our bodies aren't really made for the world we live in today, yeah. and yeah. we all can't be monks or go to hunter gather. Like, how do you think about that in relation to some of your philosophies and, and thinking? Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, so what I think is a variation on what Arthur was saying, because um, I travel almost every year with the Dalai Lama across Japan. And I'm 22 years younger, and I'm exhausted at the end of the day. And he, after eight and a half hours, every day never takes a break. And then I remember, while I'm getting my beauty sleep and enjoying my continental breakfast in the morning, as Arthur was saying, he's going through his first four hours of meditation in his 80s on the road, waking up at 3.30. So, as you said, we can't all be monks, we can't all be the Dalai Lama, but I think, my goodness, if the busiest person I know can devote himself to four hours or eight hours every day, I can probably spare 20 minutes. And if I just sit without my devices in the corner of a room for 20 minutes every day, I'm sure everybody I meet that day is going to benefit. As, composed with, as opposed to getting online, instantly checking the news, getting my emails, and feeling myself uh, on Times Square on New Year's Eve, which is the equivalent. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the theory of, of, of theories in evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology, they explain a lot about human suffering. So for example, in, in my field, we, there, we, we, we notice that there's, a, there's a, uh, an unhappiness bias in the status quo. And part of the reason for that is that the, we have this an unbelievably you know, well-ordered system for reacting to outside stimuli called the limbic system of the brain. And what that does is it, 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 it processes things that are happening to you in the outside world and gives you emotions to deal with them appropriately so that you will survive and pass on your genes. Again, Mother Nature doesn't care if you're happy. Mother Nature wants you alive, passing on your genes. That gives you a bias toward misery. The number one, the master emotion of all the emotions is fear. When you're walking across the street and a, a, a car comes speeding toward you, missed the red light, is about to run you over, that crosses the visual cortex in the back of your brain. It signals to your amygdala, part of your limbic system, light up like a Christmas tree. That sends an electrical signal through your hypothalamus to your pituitary gland, then sending a signal to your, to your adrenal glands, spitting out cortisol, epinephrine, and norepinephrine in 74 milliseconds. You've jumped out of the way, your heart is pounding, you're sweating, and you've flipped off the driver before you know what happened because your prefrontal cortex is three seconds behind. What's that all about? Thank God for misery. Thank God for fear, sadness, for, for, for disgust, which says that that thing on the bottom of your shoe is something to be avoided. That keeps you alive. The trouble is that the unhappiness bias makes you unhappy. And that's something that we need to deal with consciously. We also have a prefrontal cortex. I believe that we also have a, a God module <laughs> such that we can be fully human while we have these machine-like tendencies. So I believe, and I think that, the, that all of this is entirely consistent. The idea of the 
the awakened brain and the divine self is entirely consistent with the nature of our, of our evolved biology and our evolved psychology. And sometimes they're at odds. And even that tension is a beautiful thing. Mm. Even that tension is an interesting thing. I mean, I'm, I feel most alive when I'm at war with myself. <laughs> That's what I want. I want that tension. I want to wake up and I say, my body tells me to stay in bed, but my heart tells me to get on my knees and pray. That's the tension. That's the essence of being. That's the difference between me and my dog, Chucho, who's a very limbic, a good boy, but a limbic creature. <laughs> and I'm, I don't have to be that. Thank you. And the unhappiness bias, don't you think, means that we're not really seeing things in the correct proportions. Mm. At any point, we're most conscious of what's going wrong in our place and our time. So I find, as I go into my 60s, the world has really progressed in the course of my lifetime in terms of rights for every constituency, in terms of technology, as you were saying, in terms of health. But we tend to be fixated on what's going on wrong right now right. and not taking the wider perspective. For sure. And that's, you know, that bias is critically important, to be sure. Interestingly, that is that, that, that uncertainty bias, that unhappiness bias exists in, in the moment. But we have what we call a, uh, a falling affect bias later on, which leads us later uh, to be happier and to remember things actually better than they were. And the reason for that is because the current misery falls away, but what we learned and the benefit we got from it stays with us. And the fading affect bias is called fading affect bias. And the reason that that's critically important is because when we lean against change, all we get is the uncertainty bias and the misery the, in the status quo. We don't get the fading affect bias. And so what this leads us to is a behavioral principle that's very important for self-management. When there's change, lean into it. Lean into it. Whether I, it's a, the psychologists talk about this concept of liminality, the time, be, and all of us have had this this time time between the tides in our lives, and you, what you need to do is there's a, a, there's a metaphor that I like. You know, when I was, I was a kid, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and I used to fish um, sometimes um, off the rocks on the Oregon coast, and it turns out that. It's hard to fish off the rocks in the Oregon coast. It's hard to know how to do it correctly. And one day I was a little kid, maybe 11 years old, and, and I was catching nothing in this old kind of wizened mariner from the, from the village, you know, from the town. He's, and he says, he has a shack. And he comes up and says, hey, kid, I've been watching you. I mean, today he'd probably be arrested. But, the, you know, he says, um, he said, you're not catching anything, right? And I said, yeah. He says, because you're doing it wrong. And I said, what do I need to do? He says, you need to, you need to fish for the, in the falling tide and the falling tide is when the tide is going out really fast. And there's only about half an hour, really, really fast, between the rocks. I said, that make, doesn't make sense. All the fish are gone. He said, no, that's when all the bait fish are stirred up so the game fish are going crazy. He said, it's half an hour from now. He had his own fishing pole. And so we wait, and he says, now. We throw in our fishing pole. We throw in our lines, and we're pulling them out one by one. It's like super fun. It's unbelievable. After, you know, 20 minutes or half an hour, I mean, we had a ton of fish, and we're sitting on the rocks, exhausted. He, he's acting all philosophical at this point. You know, he lights up a cigarette. He says, kid, you know, during a falling tide, you can only make one mistake. And I said, what? He said, not having your line in the water. And I always remember that, you know, because maybe a third of you right now are experiencing a falling tide. Um, you're, and your uncertainty bias and your misery bias is saying this is terrible. You know, somebody has left you in your life or you're afraid of something in your health or there's some tragedy that's befallen you or you're really afraid of something that might happen. You're in a falling tide. This is the most fertile period. This is a time for you to get your line in the water. And that's one of the big lessons I learned during the epidemic, but that I still try to keep with me today. Thank you. More questions? Good. Over here and then... Oh. Hello, uh, we are Janina and Alan from New York, and thank you so much for the wonderful moment and your, of your experience. So I have a question for you both, and it's uh, after somebody spent uh, many years in their life uh, achieving um, the study of uh, happiness and purpose, and and then it arrived to the understanding of the importance of faith, family, friendship, love for others. How can you survive in a world that doesn't understand your purpose? Mm. Pico's better for this, Ed, because you've been writing about these principles of happiness equals love for a lot longer than I have, and you've been thriving in this world 
notwithstanding that fact. How, how do you survive in a world of misery when you write about happiness and love? I don't think a world of misery is a world of unkindness. And I think one of the things that hits me, and I go on retreat every three months, and that's partly because when I'm racing from the supermarket to the pharmacy, I'm not really in a position to assess anything, including myself, but most of all the people around me. And as soon as I go, I go up to a place of stillness and clarity, I feel that the dirty secret in most of the people I know is that they're much nicer than, than they let on to. It's not that they actually have some terrible vice hidden within their closet, but actually that they have an openness, a, a sweetness, a compassion that often they keep well defended, but is there. And that, so whenever I step out of the world, my estimation of the rest of the population goes up dramatically. And it's as if a lens cap has fallen off because I think when I'm making uh, ungenerous judgments about people, it's nearly always got to do with me. It's got nothing to do with them. So everybody has her own purpose, but I don't think people are hostile to the purpose of anyone else. I think actually deep down we want to encourage that purpose, but especially of the people ar around us. And so that's why I try not to focus on whether COVID is surge is happening in Iran, which is tragic, but I can't do very much about it. I try to concentrate on the people right here whose lives I can positively affect this afternoon. When you wake up in the morning, is your first cognition happiness or unhappiness? I wish it were either. <laughs> Neither, but the Dalai Lama's younger brother gave me a good piece of advice, and he said, every morning you're taking a shower. You've got 15 spare minutes. What are you going to use that time for? And he said, why don't you think about what, what, act good, what good acts, what constructive things you can do in the course of that day? I don't actually do that enough, but I do think it's very good advice. Uh -huh. And the reason I ask that is because for a lot of people, the barrier is not that the outside world is so terrible. It's that the interior that you're with and your status quo is so difficult. A lot of people have a lot of trouble with happiness. And that's when you, you know, and there's a reason, by the way, that I study happiness, because I want it. You know, I talk to my students, it's funny, on the first day of class, you know, I, I, I make them take 16 happiness surveys, and they're all from all different parts of their personality and their affect and their, their goals and their values and the whole thing. And then I, we look at this, you know, general well-being instrument that they take. And, uh, and I say, put your hands up if you're in the bottom half of this. And they do. And I say, how do you feel about that? And they say, I don't like it. It's, I'm doing something wrong. And I said, I'm there with you. That's why I study happiness. That's the challenge. Look for the thing that you don't have. Give it to other people. And life actually has meaning under those circumstances. It's not, you know, despair, um, according to, for Jews and Christians, despair is a sin. And despair is the lack of hope. You can... Pico is saying that something that, that people are fundamentally good, but the world is full of things that can be done and you can do it, and that's the most empowering thing possible. I'm a work in progress, and that's what actually gives me energy. Is there something that I can do today? Yeah, uh, two and a half minutes, I saw there was a gentleman back here with oh, a hand We up. just wanted to just ask one, yes. one, one question, and it's uh, Arthur's book, uh, Strength to Strength, this was a great gift, I think, for all of us. Yeah. And the struggle, uh, if you could just share just briefly the spirituality, which is one of the themes and the central theme of the book, yeah. is number one. Number two, the um, uh, HBS, uh, being a, a, a student there, um, he never had someone such as yourself at all uh, there at that time. <laughs> and I'm just wondering what are their questions because they're there for a require to acquire to acquire yeah 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 and you know i'm giving a talk at, i've mentioned it, at 12 30 the greenwald pavilion called how to want less and that's this is the most important thing i mean if you if you really want to be happy having more is not the key wanting less is the key easier said than done i'm going to give you the tricks the techniques um, it's not hacks it's habits it's, it's fundamentally what it comes down to and that's what i talk about a lot i mean at the most famous business school in the world telling them to want less you know, that's tricky business, right? But I have 180 students and 400 on the waiting list, and there's an illegal Zoom link they think I don't know about <laughs> into the class. You know, there's supposed to be, it's where they go when they have COVID, and it turns out there's like 110 of them on the Zoom link, and some of their parents. And I, like, I, I don't know, I know nothing, right? The whole point is, um, I want more of this out there is what it comes to. Now, the, the title of the book is From Strength to Strength. That comes from the 84th Psalm. Michael el Chael in Hebrew, which means may you go from strength to strength, an ancient Judaic blessing 
that says that no matter where you are in your life, and this is the point that Pico has been making, it makes through all this work and that we're trying to make here this morning, is that you're going to go from one thing to another. That's what life is. It's a series of things. May they be one strength to another strength. And if they don't look like strengths, look harder <laughs> is the bottom line. Because that's what King David is actually saying in the 84th Psalm. It's not that, that may the next circumstance be just spontaneously rosy and fun. It's that may you make it so. That's really the point of all that. And that's what I'm trying to do with my students and everybody I write for. And that's my, my prayer and blessing for all of you and everybody. Is that may we construct our lives such that each tragedy that befalls us, each blessing that we enjoy, each person that we meet, may it be the next strength in our life. And may each tragedy better prepare us for the tragedies sure to come. No doubt. <laughs> adventures, indeed. Adventures, indeed. Thank you all. We've run out of time. Thank you.